it's terrifying for a lot of people. And the blinkers are off about where this European project is going. It's so dangerous. It is so dangerous. I mean, there is definitely going to be a blowback. Yeah. We saw it after, you know, all of the destabilization in Iraq and Afghanistan and that gave rise to Islamic State mm. and all the further consequences that came from that. It all came out of that. This will probably be the same as well. Because what other conclusion could you draw if you were a Palestinian or, or a Muslim other than that, as far as Europe and America is concerned, your life is irrelevant. You are not as important as a white child. That's what they're saying. Your kids yeah. don't count. They don't feel pain. They don't believe they're not important. That's what they're saying. And that's a shocking message. And then the same people who are saying that will look down their noses at the disaffected youth in Dublin and sort of blame them. Claire Daly. You got a an early flight or was it late flight? A very night? early flight with no sleep. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people probably don't know that the European Parliament sits in Strasbourg in France once a month, which is an incredibly costly and environmentally and financially ridiculous venture. So you can't get out of that place. So we had to get a flight this morning from Frankfurt. So a car to Frankfurt from Strasbourg and then flight from Frankfurt. And uh, yeah, so Here you are. if I ramble on, I'm incoherent. I, that's my excuse out of the way anyway. Okay, Grant, well, you have your coffee in front of you, so you don't really excellent. have an excuse. And excellent buns made by your mother, Fair Play, so <laughs> I, I do recommend them seriously. Claire's recommended whoever I ask to come on my podcast next do because you'll avail of my mum's buns, which, is, which are fantastic. Absolutely, they're special. Mm. <laughs> Claire, on my way up to the studio, I was actually listening to your latest podcast episode with Mick Wallace. It is very interesting and um, I think it really just sheds a light on things that I suppose we don't get to see here in Ireland because the media have a certain way of, you know, uh, reporting on things. And I think I, I like the fact that you are so, I suppose, outspoken mm. um, and that. And so your podcast, I Foresee Trouble, is is fantastic. Um, you, you're here on the day after the riots in Dublin. And I suppose, like your thoughts on that, is that just disenfranchised youths or? I mean, we were just gobsmacked ourselves, like all of the phones and all the messages going from everybody in Belgium to Strasbourg to what is going on here? And in some ways you kind of say, well, was this inevitable? But then in other ways you say, Ireland never thought it would see scenes like that. I mean, my sister works in Parnell Square. She said it was absolutely terrifying actually to witness what was going on. What's the origins of it? Well, obviously, we had two di separate incidents. We had the horrific stabbing of three young children in broad daylight in Dublin. Now, whether the individual was mentally ill or whether it was... We don't know the details of that. It's a tragedy, but I suppose the positive out of that was, was that he was stopped from inflicting further damage by the coming together of... Irish people, traditional Irish people and new Irish people. We had the Brazilian um, delivery driver who walloped him with his helmet. There was Irish women who surrounded and American women. So you had, and then you had all of the staff from the Rotunda coming out, helping, giving people treatment, many of them from different nationalities and backgrounds. And that's the, the real Ireland, if you like, that delivered sort of, you know, true solidarity. And then you had that instant being used or abuse, or I don't know how they managed to turn that into an organised orgy of violence led by the far right. And it was organised. Now, your question, were disenfranchised youth on it? I'm quite sure they were. But somebody gathered them to that point. And it is the case that the far right are being very well funded, very well organised. This is not accidental. And they're manipulating and preying on people who have very legitimate concerns, very legitimate outrage about their own standing, about the state of the country. But nothing excuses what happened last night and the fear being put into ordinary people. So I think in part it's it's deliberately organised far right mayhem. And then on the other side, it's the neglect by successive governments of serious sections of our community which is leading to total display and destruction. Yeah, because just, you know, the housing crisis alone, there are people desperate for houses, they don't have them. Um, youths being brought up in homelessness. Mm. That's the truth. And I suppose that there is that view, some of them are seeing houses being given to foreign nationals that are coming into the country. People that have come from war zones like Ukraine and they're 
I suppose being fed a rhetoric of if they're getting a house, how come we can't? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, there was always that sort of like when I was a county councillor years ago, you would have had that. Oh, I can't get a house. This woman's after rocking in from Africa and she's driving a big BMW or the state bought her a car and all this kind of thing. And yeah. it, of course it wasn't true. The new generation stuff, though, is is a bit different because I think the crisis being experienced by people is so bad. So it's not even that they're giving out houses to anybody, but it's that the people who are coming in, be they Ukrainians or be they people in direct, are getting the blame of that. Now, who's responsible for that? Well, the government are for not building houses, but also for framing the narrative. I mean, time after time in the last two years, the government has got up and said, we are going to take as many Ukrainians as we like, we will build them houses. We're going to build houses for Ukrainians. And, you know, I think anybody is welcome here escaping, you know, a war or conflict or in search of a better life. I'm very happy to see anybody coming and settling in Ireland. But for a government to say, we'll build houses for Ukrainians, like what does that say to the non-white non-European refugees who've been in direct provision for years, allowed to live here, but no housing for them. What does it say to the working class mother who has her daughter and her grandchildren on the couch and had been told by governments for years, we've no houses for you, that they say somebody can suddenly come in and they say, well, we'll build a house. Like that's basically saying you're worthless. And people are feeling that. They feel their government thinks they're worthless and then they take it out not on the government but on the poor Ukrainian or the poor person coming in from Afghanistan or from Palestine or whatever. Yeah, It's so destructive but it was ever so. That's what the system does when it's in crisis. It likes to put ordinary people against ordinary people and then the guys making the money get off scot-free but I think sadly we're going to see a lot more of this. Well isn't that the concern? Like, I mean I've been just devastated with what's going on in Palestine at the minute. I think it's really hit home because it's so available, those pictures mm. and videos on social media, okay? And and I know there's this rhetoric of, oh, you can't talk about Palestine without talking about Israel. And But it seems like, even though this is on a very small level, it's, it's bullies going in, picking on other people that are minorities it's um, is it like it almost seems like it's connected in some way mm -hmm. like it's all the war in Ukraine all of this unrest well it is because our, our society is in total chaos and I mean I think people are genuinely shocked at the European response to Palestine it's a well, basically, Israeli terror. I mean, the Pope, fair play to him, came out today and said, this is not war, it's it's terrorism. That's what he called uh, Israel's actions. I mean, a country, to a state to openly declare that it's engaging in genocide. And as you say, we get to see it. I mean, I never, ever thought I would see scenes like we see, you know, body bags mounted up of children. And then I go into the European Union and we ask for a minute's silence for the Palestinian children and the president, who's by all accounts a very nice woman, not Ursula von der Leyen now, but <laughs> Metzola. And she said, uh, no, no, this is just for the Israeli children. And then in her minute's silence, she said, this is no time for whataboutism, meaning to ask for something was whataboutism. You can say, this this is appalling. And she, can we find it? But we do have to find it in our hearts to, you know, feel bad for the children of Palestine as well. I mean, are they ever going to have a hope? Can we keep them away from extremism? So it was kind of nearly like, oh, well, we should be sorry for them if, because if we don't, they might end up hating us. Going, well, yeah, well, they might yeah. with behaviour like that, you know. So I think it is all connected and it is... I suppose it's the crisis of the economic system that we live in. Israel is doing what it does because the US allows it to do so, like, you know, and that is why it's getting away with it. But it the EU stop. is kind of and the EU as well. now is, and that's the problem, is that the EU has gone on, is now like a vassal state of the US. They actually don't even make their own decisions. Whatever the US wants, they go, we'll go along with that, which is just kind of crazy, particularly when you know, Europe has a lot more to offer than that people would have thought. And they believe this rhetoric that, oh, Europe, it's Europe of values and democracy. And when we go into Africa and these places, it's not that we are pursuing our own e interests. The Russians do that. The Chinese do that. We're bringing democracy and values. Well, I think for the people in Africa who got rid of the Europeans and the French there recently see it as exactly the same thing because it is. These are former colonial countries who are now engaged in new world colonialism all over again. They're in it for themselves. And I think the populations of the global south now 
which are young, educated, they're not going to put up with it anymore, really. So yeah. we're in a very unstable world where the US is losing its dominance. It was one of the, while Russia is absolutely responsible for invading Ukraine and has to take responsibility for that, totally illegal. It was a proxy war as well. NATO provoked that war led by the US and they have to take responsibility for that. But out of that then, we have economic austerity in Europe. We have sanctions, which were supposed to punish Russia. And we said, we're not voting for that. And because of that, we got named Putin puppets and the Kremlin stooges and all this sort of stuff. But we're saying, well, we're doing it not because we love Putin, but because it's not going to work. You're only going to punish yourself. And now, two years later, Russia has surpassed Germany as the leading economy in Europe. There's an economic crisis in Germany, a recession. And you've all this madness and chaos as desperate, ordinary people can't make ends meet or can't get houses and are lashing out at migrants when they should be blaming the government and saying, well, if we didn't spend as much money on militarism, we might have a bit of money for a public health service or for a few houses or that sort of stuff. So yeah. it is all connected for sure. And and actually what, what strikes me as well in the media, when you the way yourself and Mick Wallace are represented sometimes, all the times maybe, <laughs> is that yeah. like crazy, you oh, know, yeah. or... I remember telling someone that I had was having you on today. She goes, "Oh my goodness, that bad shit crazy one." I was like, "What? <laughs> Why? How can someone think that?" And then I'm looking back on some, kind of some of the propaganda about. So there is definitely people thinking that you, you know, you sympathise with China with with Russia because of the stance that you took on Ukraine. Now I think now they people are beginning to kind of see. Why? But how do you deal with that? There's so many things that you've touched on there, right? And it is so totally mad. I mean, you're right. Like, but I mean, how could someone's reputation and personality be debased in such a successful way is one way of looking at it, like, you know, because everything I say and do in Europe is a continuation of everything I said and did in the doll. I use elected positions to try and argue for social justice and against war, against militarism. My whole political life has been anti-war. So the idea that, you know, my stance in Ukraine would be anything other than anti-war is ludicrous. And the people labelling me were the people who've supported every single other war that has taken place. They were the ones who allowed Shannon Airport to be used by the US military on its way to invade Iraq, Afghanistan, kill a million people uh, over there. And they had no problem with that. And suddenly they're the great harbingers of peace and all this. And we're the demons. We said exactly the same there. We wanted the war to stop because ordinary people always lose out in war. But that was twisted into Putin puppets. Now, how did they do that? Um, and you're totally right. It was so success- I mean, it was horrific at the time do of the war. Do you feel like... Well, you like would have. How like, do you feel when that happens? To you is it is it terrible or can you just like let it go over your head? It's like this is like being cancelled, right? The yeah. scale of it, right? Okay. I've never. So I suppose I'm 55. I've been involved in politics 40 years. I suppose of campaign and politics, elected politics for a long time, and I never experienced the vitriol that we got subjected to like this. I mean, it was during the time of COVID. I actually, to be honest, was glad that the masks were in. I actually, at a certain period, I used to come into Dublin airport. I put my thing on, put my mask over my face and say, thank God. I was expecting to people to come up and attack me. And I remember somebody came up to me in the airport once and I didn't recognise. I literally jumped out of my skin because I thought, here's someone coming over to verbally abuse me. And I think in, I was on the streets, it was a couple of months after the war on um, the Haypenny Bridge. And it was really funny because there was, well, not funny, haha, like, but there was one man who just said, how are you, Claire? That was normal, grand. Another, how are you? And then two things happened together too. And these were all men, incidentally. But anyway, there's this really nice man in a suit was approaching me. And then there was another big fat man on the bridge shouting there, oh, Russian puppet stooge, Putin's whore, literally, and the rest. While this very respectable man in a suit was coming up and shaking hands with me and saying, I'd just like to say, congratulations to yourself and Mick Wallace. You've been the voice of reason in this. While the other fellow was shouting and roaring and everybody was standing by. So... I suppose what I'm saying is, is that that rhetoric and that constant, constant attack had an impact on some because we invited a school group over to the parliament. And I remember one, the, one, the teacher saying that some of the parents said, what, you know, you're going to the school invited by by her. Is that really in the best interest of the school? Uh, really, should we be doing this? And the school said, well, 
she's the only one who invited us. So like, you know, they're organising the trip and they did go and they had a great time. They've come back since and all of that. But it just goes to show. But on the other side of it, the amount of people who contacted us as well, who said, you're speaking for me. I'm afraid to speak up with my friends. I know this isn't right. I know that in every war, you never send arms into a war that that only keeps it going. People would say, we've never said, and we don't say now, nobody is saying arm the Palestinians because you know if you'd arm them, it'd just continue to them being massacred to keep the war going. Now, Europe seems to be happy to keep the war going. But in Ukraine, that's what we, we continued the war. We prevented peace from happening. And our only position on that was to articulate against that. I mean, I'm on a Ukrainian hit list as a Russian um, propagandist for two things, and it's defined. And the two things I said, one was that sanctions hurt the people of Europe. I absolutely stand over that fact. Our economies are in tatters now, while Russia has surpassed us, has surpassed Europe as the dominant economy. Uh, and the second thing I said was that this was a NATO proxy war. And it quite frankly is. I've had the head of NATO in before us at defence committees saying, uh, Putin said to us he wanted, you know, less NATO and all this. Ha, ha, ha. He's got more NATO. Uh, we're on, and they're the ones arming it. So, yeah, it was it was crazy and it's definitely had an effect. Now, but do you fear for your safety? Ah, no, not some, really. If you're on the hit list. I'm not or, any, uh, well, well, yeah, well, that or, actually, the staff were a bit worried about that, yeah. I mean, particularly when that young Russian journalist, one whose father was some... Kremlin affiliate or something. She was just a journalist and she was killed. But no, I don't. I, I don't think so. But I probably, yeah, I mean, you'd have to be a bit mindful of that. Mm. I mean, these things are serious. There's other people on it. Lula, the president of Brazil, is on it. There's loads of about 70 or 80 people on it. It's quite a, a compliment of different people who really, I suppose, were people who came from very different political backgrounds, including a lot of, of Americans in that. But what we had in common was we rejected the NATO narrative of this war. Mm. And that's really why we ended up on the list, you know. But like, has that influence? But you're like, people definitely, the media kept coming up with this thing and it's sort of clear and make have gone to Europe and sure, they've gone mad. Yeah. They've gone mad. They're hanging out with all the all these, you know, weird countries and carrying on nonsense. Absolutely not true. Like we are actually one of the most, two of the most well-known MEPs in Europe. No question or doubt about it. We, I mean, I've been invited, I've been speaking at meetings and I doubt any of the other MEPs have been invited at peace meetings in really respected academic fora in Vienna, in Stockholm, in Berlin. We were invited to Rome last weekend. I've been invited to Sardinia with peace women after Christmas. We were addressing a conference in Macedonia. The Georgian people invited us over. All of these because they watch what we say in the parliament and they find it a breath well, of fresh actually, air. I was going to say because... When you go on your own Instagram mm. page, the clips that you talk, mm. like when you're talking in Parliament in there and the clips that are put up, they're the entire video. Mm, mm, mm. So you can see that what you say from the beginning to the end. Mm. Whereas what the media do over here, or certainly I've seen it, is they take the little bit in the middle where you're 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 clearly mm. like, you know, you're a passionate mm. woman, I can tell, mm. even though you're talking now and your voice <laughs> raises and, and you're, you know, you just, and people would look at the, the, you know, the small 20 second clip mm. and think she's a mad woman, but they don't see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's so sad because I think if anyone listened to the podcast mm. with yourself and Mick, they'd realise, mm. you know, the arguments that you give are really unbiased. You, you debate amongst each other, you talk about what goes on. And it's it's fairly black and white. Isn't it scary that sort of having a different opinion is a reason enough to get you cancelled? Oh. And that's basically what's happening here. Mm. And we talk about the battle between, or Ursula f likes to talk about the battle between authoritarianism and democracy. But actually in this battle, Europe is becoming incredibly authoritarian where to have a different view is unacceptable. Now that happens in every war, like the Iraq war. You know, they said, oh, this is weapons of mass destruction and all this kind of thing. So truth is the first casualty. We we kind of know that. But even in that war, there was a space to say you could argue an anti-war position. In this war, you couldn't. If you argued an anti-war position, that was immediately deemed to be you're a Russian bot. Conversation shut down. The person against you didn't have to justify, explain or go into the re Russian bot. That's it. 
how did we get to that stage? Like, it's terrible. Now, I do think some of it was seized upon by there's a section of Irish society who we were very Europhile. They love the EU and they've always been embarrassed that the people of Ireland have rejected all the treaties, that we're proud of our history, of our neutrality, of our sovereignty. We want to be in Europe, but we want to be in Europe as equals, as Irish people. We've a lot to offer as Irish people. Mm -hmm. They find that a bit embarrassing. You know, we were formerly oppressed people. It's better to, you know, pretend that we were with the big boys, the old colonialists, and we're one of them. And they've actually been embarrassed by our, the people's rejection of, of multiple European treaties because we're the only country where the people actually get to vote. And we should remember that because people say we're not European. I was at a packed meeting in Stockholm three weeks ago, which was out the door. And the amount of people who said, thank you so much. We're being frog marched into NATO. Our people don't have any say in this. We love what you say in the parliament. It's such a voice of hope for us. And we love that Ireland is neutral. And we hope you're not going to lose that and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, the, I think people saw the war in Ukraine. The people were so upset by watching what was happening there that they thought they could come in for the, the killer and get rid of that Eurocritical voice. Because we are Eurocritical. We're mm -hmm. not anti-European. And we're actually more pro-European than anyone else, I think. But I d am very critical of the EU because mm -hmm. it's a project that's been led by corporate interests now. It's becoming very Americanized, yeah. like the way the American big lobbies control the president. They pay for him and they make sure that he dances to their tune and is usually he. But Europe is becoming like that as well, where it's the lobbyists and all of that. 65,000 lobbyists in Brussels alone. They're the ones deciding policy like, and that's, they don't want that party, they party disrupted, you know. So there is a battle going on where these Eurocentrics or the European institutions themselves are in a bit of a power grab over member states. And I think people like Michal Martin want to be part of that. They want Ireland to give up its sort of sovereignty to be part of the big boys club. But I don't think Irish people do. Well, actually, that was part of it. Do you think that, that you know, there is talk about NATO and joining it or in some way, shape or form, do you think that's just a way of sucking up to the Americans? A way, is it a part of being, you know, uh, people scratching each other's backs, the boys scratching, you know, out for each other? Yeah, a bit of that. Like, I mean, I, you know, they've said, oh, we're not going to join NATO, but we do want to have the right to sort of just do more cooperative work with their mm -hmm. European neighbours and all this, which actually in the present moment is with NATO. So it's a red herring to say that. But I think with the, the sort of bending to the elites in Europe, I mean, the the joke is that Michal Martin is looking for a job out there when his term finishes, but it almost smacks of that. It's so servile. I mean, these are the people probably in the olden days would have doffed the cap to the English Lord or their people who prostrated the country to the American multinationals. We're better than that. Like our president is better than that. Michael D has been brilliant like to sort of say, yeah, we're Irish, we're different, we were oppressed, so we can bring something to the party that no one else can in Europe. We're a very firmly Western, pro-American country. We have a lot of cultural links with America, but we were oppressed and we have a solidarity with the people of the global south that no other European country has. And we that's backed up by our peacekeeping. And they're prepared to jeopardise all that yeah. in order to fuel and be the puppets of US militarism. And you see some of the hierarchy even in the Irish army and the Irish Defence Forces have over the last few years been sort of integrated into a command structures, send some officers over there, get to know people, go on joint ventures and then suddenly we're all morphing in. But the Parliament the other day voted on a motion to have a defence union which would include um, a permanent deployment capacity, which is a standing army, European one, uh, under a European leadership. And in the same day, Michal Martin talks about the triple lock going, that we would be sending our troops overseas without a UN mandate. So are the men and women in the Irish Defence Force is then going to be sent to some EU venture in Mali or Africa where the French might be and lose their lives there in fighting for colonial interests of France. I, I don't think that's what Irish people want. So no, crazy, not. crazy. You you touched on about um, when you were you know on the Haypenny Bridge and mm. it was all men that were coming. Mm. It was either bad, good or bad. Have you experienced uh, you know a lot of that as in misogyny as a, a female in the public eye standing up for you know your the political views that you have? My traditional answer to that was no. 
that I hadn't really experienced it really all that much, not that much in a gendered form. I suppose I've always been, I was a student union leader, I was a trade unionist, I've probably been always used to being active or in a leading position in sort of men's arenas as they were all those years ago, much less so now, thankfully. But targeted sort of gendered misogyny, I probably would have felt I escaped a lot of that until the war in Ukraine. I mean, the emails, and I I don't, I mean, I see people go on programmes about, oh, I get targeted on social media. People say mean things about me and all that, and it's terrible. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I think some politicians over-egg that and over-milk it because it does go part of the territory and sometimes people say things they shouldn't and sometimes it's not acceptable and you have to be able to take some of that. But the some of the emails and comments that we got on Ukraine were I had never and they were from very respectable probably what the, my office called rugby dads um, but like on all gendered so it was always you were Putin's whore like so respectable, sexually violent. totally sexually innuendo um, invoking rape in terms of rape and, and Russian soldiers and all of that so I'd never experienced anything like that and these were from sort of respectable Dublin addresses quite shocking now quite quite shocking and it was very much gendered and that never happened to me before and I went this is actually shocking it's not that I didn't think it existed but I just it was so blatant and so bad normally they're a bit more subtle than that but uh, and I think it is difficult because you know you had the usual stuff obviously so being a politician in Ireland if you're a woman, they're going to much more focus on your appearance. So you feel bad about that, what you look like, what you wear. All of that is worse if you're a woman. Of course it is, like, you know, but you kind of, you shouldn't have to, but you kind of take it. So I suppose I'm a bit like I suffer from my back. I don't know if you could recommend anything, but I have a constant back problem. It's always there. It's always a pain, but it's part of what I am. So I suppose some of that misogyny, it's, part of what you put up with. We shouldn't put up with it and we don't, but it is kind of there in the background, but it definitely came to the forefront in that. Madness. Never saw anything like it. Yeah. And then they would, as they say, a lot of politics, I suppose, in Ireland would be quite aggressive. And I I don't like aggression. I I much prefer points of agreement with people and all of that, but it can be difficult to have your voice heard. And then if you try and raise your voice as one, then you're hysterical. Oh, yeah, hysterical. Well, actually, I'm not. I'm just trying to shout over you who are shouting me down. Uh, So it's a kind of a, it's a fine line, isn't it? You know, it's a Do you find you have to be more careful about what you'd say compared to, say, a man in the same position? Or do you really care? I don't really care. I like to engage with people on points of agreement. So I don't like aggressive conversations anyway. It's not what I like. I, I much prefer to start with a point of agreement and have a dialogue. Um, I just find it's really disappointing that Western societies now, you can only have one narrative and a different viewpoint is a heinous crime I mean, some of the people who used to write to us during the Ukraine thing, they'd say, you don't represent me. I hope you, you know, you'll never get elected. No one will ever vote. And I kind of go back and say, look, I totally respect that. I don't represent you and you have a different viewpoint and you're perfectly entitled to that. Isn't it great that we live in a democracy? I said, but myself and Mick Wallace are 15 percent of the Irish elected MEPs, I can guarantee you that at least 15% of the people in Ireland agree with the call for peace. Actually, the Pope put the same position as us for a negotiated settlement and end to the violence, at least 15%. So can we not have a different view? This idea that we all go to Europe, it's not really, and then we should all be the same. Yeah that there is no politics there. There is politics there. The idea that we would be on the same side as Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael when we go to Europe, when we're not on it, when we're here. Of course we're not, like. But the media play on to that. They, and it's against the vacuum of no knowledge. As you say, nobody knows anything that goes on in Europe. And we try with the podcast. There's no coverage. We've come to the doll in the last few weeks with the idea of an Oireachtas TV equivalent, that there should be a sort of a European Parliament TV where people don't have to rely on the Irish Times hate campaign against us to say, well, oh, what madness have Claire and Mick done uh, this week? It can be, actually, we can go on and watch the Parliament and not just Claire and Mick and not just the Irish MEPs, but all the MEPs. Yeah. These are decisions that are affecting your life and no one knows anything about it because of that information gulf and the uh, narrative forming from the establishment. So, yeah, yeah, I think we need to, we really need to, um, be much more 
visible from a European point of view. And I would really hope that they, like the Oireachtas have said, oh no, it costs too much money to have a European Parliament TV, but I don't buy that at all, to be honest. It doesn't seem like it would. I'm, I'm sure they, could, they, they have can stream the, Netflix. They can stream. Well, they the have European all the Parliament. footage is there. Yeah. All they don't, all they need to send a few people over there and broadcast and a bit of editing, because the way it is now, you have to know what you're looking for to find it. And the European Union is a total bubble. And if you're in that bubble, great. You can do all the you know, European speak, and you see them on the Brussels flight, and they're all the lobbyists, and they know the MEPs, and they're all friends, and all this kind of thing. Meanwhile the citizens of Ireland, the real Europeans who are paying the price of the decisions that are being made aren't even informed of what's going on. How did you get into this whole thing? <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I ask myself that every morning. You know what, like what, obviously you you, you did it from a young age because you said that you were in college, you were head of the student, student union. union yeah. But, you know, were you always interested in, in politics? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I would come from a very, I suppose politically conservative family. My father was in the army and, and my family would have been traditionally Fine Gael, but they would have been traditionally sort of of the view that, well, you wouldn't be telling people your politics anyway, the politics is a private matter kind of thing. So, but I think we had a very strong sense of social justice and that kind of thing as well. So, you know, my sister had been a long standing campaigner for Palestine. Actually, she's brought hundreds of people over to the West Bank on tours over the years and all of that. So just there was some, but when I went to college, I suppose I just got involved in student life, student radicalism. It was the 80s. Uh, there was no jobs, loads of education cuts, health cuts. So we, I became the president of the union. And I suppose I learned a lot in that because it was the time of the uh, abortion information campaigns when the students' union leaders were being imprisoned and harassed by SPOC, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn. So it was all those days of censorship over abortion information. And I remember I was the president of the union and we led this big giant meeting for abortion information where the Irish Catholics said we were the only ones who ran a proper debate, even though the vote was about a thousand for abortion information, eight against. So, yeah, because I've always sort of believed that you have to go in and engage with people and talk to people and bring the information to them. Um, when I became president of the Students' Union, I was a country person who wasn't particularly cool or anything. So you end up in college and it's all... When you say country person? Well, I'm from Kildare. I know ah. it's down there. No, there's a lot of dubs there down, now. There's a lot of dubs there now. Road. No, I know, but we are different. <laughs> the fact that all you dubs might have invaded us over the last couple of decades because <laughs> the housing situation is not, we're still different. But no, I, had never, I was never even on a double-decker bus until I was about 17. Okay. I kid you not, like, you know what I mean? I know and we're kind of, and now we're supposed to be the darlings of the world, but uh, and I seriously wasn't. I was not on a double-decker bus until I was 17. Okay, we live 25 miles down the road, but it was a completely different world. I was terrified when I came to Dublin for the first time, you know, but when I got involved in the union, it was all the cool kids in the union, all the hipsters, the, you know, and I wasn't that, obviously. So, but we had a couple of rules where I said, right, we have none of this now. Nobody's gone into the in the back in the day. Nobody's gone into students' union meetings smoking. Smoking is banned, even though I used to smoke about fifty a day. Did you come up with that rule? Yeah, yeah. I said you're not going in. <laughs> well, we used to be able to smoke, and there's no smoking or no bad language and a terrible. With none of that being cool and different, and yeah. you know all that. You'll come in. You'll because most of the students were country kids as well. Like you'll tackle them as they are, like, and we'll treat them head on. And we used to go around and you know give them briefings all the time. And they to, sometimes they're going, oh, no, not you. They say, well, look, at, we're here to represent. There's no point giving out about us. You're here to listen to this. And then we'll go on. Yeah, so it's good. But anyway, I digress. So that was, uh, yeah, student days. So the students' union, out of that, I suppose, I, I joined the Labour Party at a certain stage because that was around the first divorce campaign. At the time, I got expelled from the Labour Party for being too radical. And then for me, politics was always organising really. So I was, you know, shop steward in my job in the airport. I was a councillor then with the big community campaigns against water charges, not the recent ones, the ones going back even further. I was reading with that. I was like, is that No, recent? no, that's okay. the older ones. But but it was out of that, I suppose. So I suppose the short answer is I never wanted or envisaged or knew anybody who was involved in electoral politics. I mean, I didn't say, oh, I want to wake, I'd love to be a TD or I'd love to be a politician. I actually find that a really a bad word, a politician. To me, politics is people organising and, and change in society comes from people organising. Usually 
the politicians, it takes them ages to actually catch up. And I think we saw that graphically with the uh, Eighth Amendment campaign. The people were well ahead of the politicians, who were the politicians who kept them back for years. So, yeah, that's what changes things. But once we started to organise and in the first water charges campaign, we did force the three Dublin councils to do a backtrack. But sort of saying, well, we're protesting against the people in power at a certain stage, the responsibility comes on you to say, well, geez, you know what, I might go in and try it myself. You know, okay. it's not enough to be just opposing those who are in there. You mm -hmm. have to try and get in and see, can you make a difference? So I was a councillor first, then a TD. And we were pretty, I know it was, a. you said, how do we end up where we are? Well, I mean, that's a long winded way around it. But like the doll, I really enjoyed the doll. Um, we were very well known. I think we did some really good stuff around guard the corruption. We used the the platform um, as a stage to articulate a lot of the issues that ordinary people felt and, and people felt that we were challenging, holding power to account, which is what our job was. And um, I think a lot of it's not enough, but a lot of the guard the reform, a lot of that corrupt guard the corruption stuff, uh, the work that Mick Wallace did on NAMA and all of that was really, really good. But we noticed that a lot of the decisions and a lot of the legislation was coming from Europe. So I kind of said, James, will we go over and see, is there any way you can change this European thing at all? Or is it irreformable? Is it too hard? Should we give it a try? So we stood and then you'd say, well, well, can you change it? And was it worthwhile? And um, I think it's very difficult, but I think it was the totally right thing to do. And ironically, going back to our conversation earlier, it was us. It was the war that proved we were in the right place at the right time. OK, it was amazing because yeah. then it went from the platform was real. We were articulating a view that people were afraid to do. I mean, I remember the first vote on the war. It was terrifying when the war happened. There were people on who agreed with us, but because of the scale of the media on the whipping up of the war jingoism, they were afraid to speak out. Like some people in the Czech Republic had to move house. There was an old lady who was uh, a Latvian MEP who voted against it. Her house was, you know, labelled. Our offices were targeted inside the building, like by staff in there. But by using the, by standing up against that vitriol, we gave a voice to loads of people in Ireland, like loads of people all over Ireland were in contact all the time to say, look, we don't know how you put up with what's been said about you, but we agree with you. You don't solve a war by more war. You don't solve a war by pumping arms in. You can only stop a war by diplomacy. And that's what we said. Like, you listen to the media, you think we were saying keep up the war. Yeah. We were saying stop the war. We're saying stop the war now and and, and it, that's acceptable in Palestine but it wasn't acceptable to say it in Ukraine. Why not? I don't think the Ukrainian poor people should be sent as cannon fodder to play NATO's games with Russia. I think that's wholly unacceptable. Actually, they should be allowed to live in their own country and we as an international community should be standing by them trying to broker a, a peace deal and stop the slaughter. I mean, if it's good enough for us to be saying that in or if it's understood in terms of Israel, why isn't it understood in terms of the war in Ukraine? I think yeah, Zelensky my, is uh, the penny's finally dropping with him. Or I think he just, he's going to be abandoned. He was a comedian. He was placed there by an oligarch. He himself was the featured in the Panama Papers for tax evasion, tax corruption. He's quite well. I think he's just a, a puppet, really. Um, I think there were huge problems with corruption in Ukraine even before the war. They have absolutely multiplied now and it's not me saying that it's the European Court of Auditors would would say that the endemic problems there. It's been terribly difficult for ordinary people for a very long time but I think the international community dangled him along. Maybe he caught, got sucked up into the idea that he was the world's most famous man. I mean the photo shoots in Vogue and all this with the wife. I mean what leader of a country does a photo shoot in vogue in the middle of the war? What war do you have politicians and actors and actresses going to the war zone for their get their photos taken? There was something incredibly unseemly with the way in which the Western media manufactured consent around this war because it was the Western media because most of the countries where most of the people in the world live had a totally different view. It's not that they supported the invasion of Ukraine no more than ourselves, but they understood that this wasn't the first war and all the people jumping up and down talking about Putin war crimes and, and, and you know, axing them out of football and cancelling artists and all this kind of thing were totally silent when 
America slaughtered a million Iraqis. They're totally silent when Israel is murdering Palestinian children. Like, that's not their game like at all. So yeah. it really, when we when the war happened and we were able to articulate that, we, we kind of began to know we were in the right place, even though it meant an awful lot of that vitriol. And it mm. was amazing. It's that, that's changed now. But I mean, like even early on, there were MEPs from other countries who came up to us and said, we agree with what you did, but we're afraid. Like, we, we can't vote this way. We'll be either in trouble with our parties or we're afraid of the backlash in our own country that we lose too much support. So they went along. But as the war went on, that began to change a bit. And some of those became more vocal. It's still, so it's completely changed now because the blinkers are off for two reasons. And, and both of them tragic, to be honest with you. The first one is the tragedy that is Ukraine itself that the war is continuing nearly two years on, uh, hundreds of thousands of people dead, millions dislocated, massive amount of damage. And they're going to have to sit down and do a peace deal on probably worse terms than they would have if the peace deal in April 22 had been allowed to stand and the West didn't allow that to stand. And people can see that the sanctions are only hurting us. They can see that the pouring arms in is only making profits for the arms industry. And they can kind of begin to see, do you know what, this is a bit of a con on the taxpayers of Europe, the taxpayers of America and the poor innocent people in Ukraine. We should be arguing for diplomacy. And one of the vehicles, I suppose, as well, that's made people think differently is the horror that's unfolding in Gaza. When you have a genocidal state, apartheid state, openly proclaiming that it is carrying out a genocide and the same people who are jumping up and down about war crimes from Russians and all this have nothing to say about it. In fact, not only have they nothing to say, they stand with Israel now and in the days to come. They have enabled this to continue in the and same way. Why is this being allowed to happen? Like, Is it is it power, money, land, oil, gas? Is it... Is it, does it boil down to that? It's, what? it's geopolitical interest, if you like. Biden years ago said if Israel didn't exist, America would have to invent it. Israel is their man on the ground. They're there as a destabilising influence in the region. I mean, this whole area of the Middle East was were formerly colonised by European powers. They drew lines on maps to make them countries. And then Israel in the middle of it is a kind of a, a destabilising eyes and ears for the US. And who benefits from that? Well, the people who benefit from it are the, the vested interests in the arms industries and so on. The, as you say, the oil manufacturers, the big boys who go and destabilise those countries. And the saddest thing for Europe is, and I think one of the things that has really upset a lot of people, because a lot of people believe the propaganda that Europe was better than the US, that they had values. And now they see them with Israel and say, how could, the, how, how could this be? How, how could this be? But they don't have values. They just have interests as well, you know, and they're not the interests of ordinary people, sadly. And I think the ramifications of this will be immense because they cannot go around the rest of the world now telling the rest of the world what to do, lecturing them about human rights when they're engaged in, in this sort yeah. of stuff, you know. But like, where do you see the whole Palestinian thing going? Like what, you know, I know you, I don't know, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, what is happening is people are being savaged, they are being killed, families are being killed. Like, they're going to breed more hate, yeah? Totally. Where Where is it all going to go? It's it's a devastating question. And I mean, I no more than anybody else. I mean, all of us, when we get up in the early days, when you get up in the morning and turn on your phone and say, I literally do not want to see what I'm seeing here, like trying to envisage the terror that people are experiencing. And here we are 47 days on to think of it. But all of the delays and all of the failure to call a ceasefire and all of this talk about truces and little bits of humanitarian aid was only to delay, to allow Israel to level the whole area. So this is the intention. They've said it. They want to clear the Palestinian population out of it. They've kind of got rid of half them, nearly. OK, they haven't got them out, but they've nowhere to live. They've no services. Where is it going to end up? I don't know, because the international community will say, oh, yes, no, Israel has to respect international law. But it's not. When it isn't, yeah, but blatantly as they're flagrantly not doing it. So they've allowed it to continue. I mean, maybe it'll stop when it's this one of the positives. It's such a bad word to use, such a wrong word to use in this context. But one of the changes that is important is the 
breaking of the link with Zionism of whole sections of the Jewish population, particularly American Jews, who are now saying not in our name. The apartheid state of Israel is not in our name. So for too long, sort of people could be accused of anti-Semitism if they were given out about Israel, which is just ludicrous, obviously. But now it's more of a break there. And I think that pressure in the US, this could cost Biden the election. I mean, it's absolutely it's going to have huge ramifications there. But where will it end up? I mean, absolutely. People in uh, Palestine, will they be radicalized by this? Well, I suppose the other side of it is, is that what they have seen is that the people of the world stand with them everywhere. I mean, the protests have been absolutely unbelievable. Do they see that? They would in their community. I mean, look, I think they see a difference between the people in power and the ordinary people. Okay. You'd have to like, you know, and then, I mean, I think it, it is, it's so obvious um, on the streets with their families who are abroad and that kind of thing. But I mean, we've had shocking things like of, there's a huge Palestinian community in Brussels, in Belgium, because the Belgians were very positively disposed towards granting asylum to Palestinians previously. So sadly, then we've loads of families who've lost loads of families and like some of them work in the European institutions and they just cannot get their heads around the fact that their bosses, if you like, are basically enabling this. And I mean, we've been doing a lot of work. We sent emails around. We've organised an event next week with some of the families of the Belgian families who want to come in and give testimony. And I had people writing back ahead of a unit in the parliament writing back. Uh, please take me off your mailing list. I don't want to be part of your political agenda. And the political agenda was a note saying we've organised a meeting with some Palestinian families who want to come in and tell their stories. And this was the head of a European unit. So the ramifications, the world will never be the same again after this. The international organisations are in crisis. Where is it going to end up? I really don't know. I think the rest of the world is going to have to kind of gang up against the US and Europe and try and rescue international law or something. Yeah. Uh, but with the people of Europe as well, because it, there's a hopelessness there. Otherwise, um, we have to do better. Uh, and I do believe that seeing stuff like the American Jews, like seeing the ordinary people all over Europe, I mean, it's been absolutely huge movements and that's been amazing. But on the other side, it is getting to the stage where people go, well, what can we do? Mm. We're coming out every week now, time after time. Our numbers are getting bigger and still they do not listen. What does that say to people? Well, I mean, it's shocking, but it's a, it's a shocking education, I suppose, that we have to build a, a different system in power. And that seems immense and difficult, and it is. But there is no other way. Like, the world is on a, a massive collision course fueled by war and well, the biggest war of all, the war on the on the climate is not being dealt with. This is actually fueling that. So, yeah, that, that's another thing that I want to talk to you about. I w- just wanted to ask you about Ursula von Leyen. Oh God, <laughs> and your thoughts fond on... of lying, as they call her. <laughs> yeah. Excuse, excuse me. Um, <laughs> but what are your 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 thoughts on her? Like, I mean, it is it's great to see women rise to the top, but, you know, she's so pro-Israeli and she went straight in there. She is responsible. How that woman sleeps at night, I have no idea. She knew exactly what she was doing when she, she went. Was she doing it on the recommendations of like a group of people? or she I think set, it was you know? a bit of a pre- power grab, right? It's definitely the case that there are diplomats in Brussels who are tearing their hair out at her, uh, assuming power that she doesn't have in law because the European Commission, they're just unelected bureaucrats. Each country can nominate one and OK, the parliament can approve them or not. But that's not an election like, you know, they're mm. not elected. And it's only the council that can decide on foreign affairs. So she's no role in foreign affairs. But it was a bit like she kind of jumped out of the traps to set the scene. It's not the first time she's done that. It's partly a power grab on her part. I know a lot of the diplomats were shocked. Um, but she's incredibly right wing. She she has history on this. Like she had done on the anniversary, the 75th anniversary of Israel, of the state, which is coincides with the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians. She came out with totally Zionist um, propaganda about this, almost making out that there was nobody in Palestine before the Israelis came and created this garden and how wonderful. So she is a, a Zionist openly so. And she's been in a place where EU policy has shifted because of her and obviously some people around her because in previous Israeli assaults on Gaza and Palestine, the European Union did call for a ceasefire. 
But right up to now, the European Union fails to call for a ceasefire. Can you believe it? Like, no. it's just unreal. I mean, fairness, Ireland has been okay. I mean, say, oh, Ireland is the most pro-Palestinian. Actually, Belgium and Spain have been better even than Ireland. But uh, it's the Germans and right across this and the Austrians and uh, some of the Eastern European countries. Unreal. Unreal. But it has been steered by her and she set the scene on that then. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 terrifying for a lot of people. And the blinkers are off about where this European project is going. It's so dangerous. It is so dangerous. I mean, there is definitely going to be uh, a blowback. Yeah. We saw it after, you know, all of the destabilization in Iraq and Afghanistan and that gave rise to Islamic State mm. and all the further consequences that came from that. It all came out of that. This will probably be the same as well as the people. Because what other conclusion could you draw if you were a Palestinian or, or a Muslim other than that as far as Europe and America is concerned, your life is irrelevant. You are not as important as a white child. That's what they're saying. Your kids yeah. don't count. They don't feel pain. They don't believe they're not important. That's what they're saying. And that's a shocking message. And then the same people who are saying that will look down their noses at the disaffected youth in Dublin and sort of blame them. Uh, but it's all joined up, as you said it yourself at the start. Up. This idea that we all stand with Ukraine and we were all united, that was a bit of red herring as well. Yeah. Like that was the kind of lead. They were able to frog march them all into that. That was already, has become very frayed anyway, mm -hmm. already. And that was a bit of a myth. But now it's, yeah, it's much more out in the open now. Um, but they, I mean, think the biggest thing that what they're looking on is the hypocrisy. That this is the European Union all went it was lecturing about international law and war crimes and values and all of this. So the other countries of the world will certainly be laughing at Europe now going saying, sorry, values, human rights, international law, sorry, Israel, don't think so. Not taking it from you anymore. Yeah. And they won't, like, they absolutely won't. Yeah. Not to mind the fact that, you know, half of Europe is fighting with itself anyway. I mean, with a big bloodbath amongst the Spaniards during the week. Uh, and you see instability within all the member states anyway. So this idea that we're all one united, happy Europe uh, was a myth for a long time. I think. Yeah, it seems it seems so. Do you think uh, China is unfairly demonised? Yeah, I do actually, yeah. I mean, we were really lucky that we were able to make a trip to China this year after COVID. It was just absolutely amazing um, to be able to see it. Um, what they've achieved in terms of, my God, cities built in you know, 30 years holding maybe tens of millions of people. We can't even build one flipping metro in 30 years, you know, and they've high speed rail and the whole lot. It's an amazing, it's an amazing society. I mean, China hasn't dropped bombs on anybody. They haven't invaded any other countries. They pretty much rely on diplomacy. They've gone into Africa. They've gone into South America. Are they pursuing their own interests there? Absolutely. They're not going in for the good of the health of the people living there. But rather than bringing guns and instability, they've done some quite good deals for infrastructure. Um, I'm sure they're getting back benefits for themselves, but the people there as well. I've seen some of their housing programs in the likes of Venezuela and so on. Much better to bring those type of gifts than to uh, bring bombs and instability, you know. Is so. there a worry, though, about the oppression of their own people? You know, they're not allowed social media. They, they're oh, not God, they've loads of social media. For feck's sake, their phones and all that stuff is absolutely rampant. They're all, every single person has me. Now, there's a lot of cameras and stuff up as well, but we, we're getting them here now as well. Our stuff is surveilled and censored. That's what I think it's always got. We just don't realise it, is that it? A lot it, of it is, isn't as open. And some of the Chinese people don't mind that. Now, I wouldn't like it myself and they're very much everything is done through the phone and all of that kind of thing those records but Europe wants to move in that direction now as well they want to have a digital ID and everything done through this get rid of cash and all that kind of stuff so um, yeah I mean we had exchanges with uh, academics with ordinary people now obviously the people we were meeting were people who could speak English with the ordinary people in the hotels we were using, well, it wasn't Google Translate because they don't have what the Chinese equivalent of Google Translate that you were doing with the ordinary people. So by virtue of your language inhibitions, you're going to be dealing with people who are better educated than that. I think they're very optimistic, the Chinese. I mean, you know, if there's repression there, why do all the Chinese who come, come back 
you know, they don't flee like they come back, they come educated in Europe and then they go back. And there is a, a vibrant sort of middle class there. We found the younger people were really optimistic and very well educated. The older people would you take your hat off to them. I thought these are amazing. Like they're running around the parks doing their exercises and all of this. But there is a group in the middle for sure who feel really hard done by. They don't have the benefits that the older people have. They don't have the opportunities that the younger people have. They're under enormous pressure like to a um, couple of jobs to make ends meet, you know, really under pressure to try and get their kids to get an education, to get on. It's not really that much unlike the Ireland. way things are here, you yeah. know what I mean? So is it much more repressed than here? Well, I don't know. But um, there were certainly, I mean, it was very, very incredibly safe country. Incredibly safe. I mean, they literally say, if you put your wallet on the ground and came back two hours later, it would still be there. Now, is that because people are afraid Scarce. of their lives? Like if somebody approaches that they'll be taken off and sent off somewhere. I don't know. But the fact is that the wallet would be there. And we didn't see any of it and we didn't see, I've seen unpleasantness in other places but we, and no dirt. Like, I mean, this, this, this is a developing country and you go, sacred heart of God, they come to Brussels or Dublin and say, we're a developing country. This is progress, is it? Because the filth and the dirt in European capitals are disintegrating and this is all new high tech. Now, it's a countryside in China in difficulty probably is. I'm not saying everyone there lives in luxury or of course they don't. No place is like that. But, it didn't seem, they seem to have something and there's incredible awareness about um, oh, climate change, the need to tackle climate change. And a lot of people who, I mean, again, it's the same point we made earlier about how does the narrative change? I mean, when I was in DCU, they began the programme of teaching Chinese. China had just come out of, you know, opened up to capitalism. And anybody who was anybody who was going to make it in business or be wanted to learn Chinese. So all the whiz kids and they were revered because China was where it's at. How did we go from that to sort of that if you say you were in China, people go, <gasps> you're in China. Yeah. What were you doing in China? And going, well, I was going to see the place to talk to people why they're our biggest trading partner. We've diplomatic relations with them. They're not at war with anybody. And you're doing that in the capacity of an MEP? Well, no, or I went to, we organised the trip ourselves. Okay, but like, okay. I mean, I feel like a responsibility when we're yeah. in the doll to go and see things for myself yeah. when I go. like because and, and I really like that and I consider myself incredibly privileged to be able to do that. But the world has become a, a tiny place and it's people do look to Europe and it, people have actually found our role in Europe to be very beneficial. I mean, we went to Pakistan after the floods, the horrific consequences of climate change on a country which is not responsible for it and 33 million people displaced there. But when we were there in the airport, we met people who came up to us and said, you're the Irish and we, you're the Irish members of parliament. We love you. We watch what you we follow what you do on social media. And um, we've had people from Africa getting in touch, people from South America, China, America itself, you know. So the world is people everywhere are asking the exact same questions and people everywhere have the same problems. That's the truth of it, because the people in power nowhere are really delivering for their people. I don't think they're doing it in China and Russia. They're definitely not doing it in America or in Europe either. And, and that's the quest that, that we have to do. So like, you're obviously very passionate. You've been passionate about causes all your life and you're, you're, mm. you're working towards a goal. But like other people in power seem to get there and then they don't listen to the people that they're supposed to represent. How does that happen? Do you think most people are like you at the beginning or... And well, with, with, with a kind of a rose tinted view of what they can do and then actually once they realise when they get there actually it's really fucking difficult they might as well just do what they can and, and be done with it what, where it could is be a combination there? of all things right and I, I obviously can't speak for other people because I don't know but I do know I sometimes get people going how do you become a TD I, I'd like to be a politician how do you become and I said well if, if you're doing it as a career I said well then I think it's completely wrong anyway like you know what I mean you've got to it's like somebody now the young people now they're saying what do you want to be I want to be famous like when I was growing <laughs> up what, nobody wanted to be famous like they wanted to be an investigative journalist or they wanted to be a doctor or a specialist space astronaut or something they didn't want to be they, were, they wanted to do something you know yeah. so I think someone who says I want to be a politician that's an immediate no no but I let's assume that everybody gets in to try and change things 
But the system is kind of stacked against that because most people have to join a party. And if you join a party, then you have to serve the party. And then you find that a lot of people spend so long in trying to get elected that once they get elected, from the day they get elected, they just spend their time working to get back in and they forget about why they wanted to stand in the first place. So they're just there to keep their seat rather than to use it to implement some of the things. that they, So they end up supporting the status quo. I mean, in the early days of the abortion issue, when we, and it was actually Mick who was for the first time when we got elected first in 2011, and it was Mick who put the issue of abortion and the X case all those years ago uh, on the agenda for the first time proactively. Other than that, no one would ever mention abortion unless there was some big tragedy that they had to kind of respond to, that people would wake up to all the time. And then that began to change after that. We moved legislation around that time. And I remember a load of the Fianna Fáil men at the time, they were quite young. There would have been young husbands or whatever young fathers saying, look, I agree with you, but... I can't be saying that out loud. I'd lose loads of votes, yeah. you know. And I mean, how bad? But that's what you see because they've a vested interest in keeping the seat or keeping the party back. In. And then that means that you actually end up reinforcing the status quo rather than changing it. I mean, I wanted to get elected to change things. I'm not arrogant enough to think that I can change things. I don't think so. I think everybody changes things with everything they do every day. But what I am is somebody who has the opportunity to have a platform and I consider myself very lucky to have that platform. What's the point in having it if you're not going to use it? So, I mean, if it ends up that the demonisation of us as a result of our stance for peace in the war, I think it's been vindicated by events. We'll definitely be vindicated by history. I wouldn't change a single thing. And if we end up losing our seats because of it, it was still a job that needed to be done. And I'm glad we had to do it. And as an outlier, because you, you are, you're you're outsiders really when it comes to that that political spectrum, I suppose. But I still feel that you can make such an impact. Oh, totally! Like, but even as outsiders, it's almost like not it's not in spite of it's because of it's amazing yeah. totally totally right we would be known across the house we get on well with people across you know you read the Irish media you think we're in the bowl corner with nobody talking to us everyone going oh my god they're the two Irish freaks <laughs> over the there they're the complete opposite yeah. every single day and this is even before Palestine this is now over the Ukraine war and peace and all of that we'd have people different translators someone would come up and they'd look around and they'd say I'm a translator I'm from them um, Slovenia, we love when you speak, we all agree with you, or I'm a security guard, or I'm this. That That would happen every single day. We'd have MEPs coming up for other countries from, you know, social democrat groups. Oh, my brother loves you. He's always given out to me that we're not more like you. So we can, we have the freedom to be able to do things. And it does have an impact. And work in the parliament is much more collaborative, like on, which we didn't talk about at all, but all the legislative files and stuff like that. We've led files. We've been a conveners of groups and have been able to bring opinion together and work with people. We've always worked with people in the dog. We never personalise political opposition. I would have got well on very well with TDs across all of the houses. I've never used our stance to have a cheap job or to promote myself at their expenses if they're in the, in the middle of some crisis where everybody wants to head us. So we've never played those games. It's absolute rubbish and doesn't serve anything, you know. So yeah. we, we can. We I mean, in Ireland, we used to plan. We got rid of two Garda commissioners and two ministers for justice. We were able to do that by using the platform and public pressure, really uniting those two things. And I think they are the things that make change because ordinary people make change. And if we can be a voice for that or to give a stage to the struggles of people, then that's really important. I mean, it's not a position you'd want to be in, but the amount of people who've contacted us around the world from the Palestinian community to say, you know, thank you just for that. There's a voice that is articulating our pain means so much. Yeah. It's frightening. It's frightening when people look on and they think that they're going mad. And even in the war in Ukraine, there was loads of people like that who were kind of going, I think I'm going mad here because I'm not allowed to have an opinion or yeah. I'm not allowed to tease out these things. I mean, how does society develop if we can't engage in critical thinking, if we can't have an exchange of views? An exchange of views means you have a different opinion. Is that a crime like mad isn't it oh it, it is it's so I, bad yeah it is and I know now you're going off to the like you're rushing off to go to the airport to pick up a mm. gentleman who is oh, doing a amazing. book signing tomorrow because he was 
a prisoner in Guantanamo. Guantanamo. Unbelievable. Oh, it's, it's just an amazing guy, Mansoor Adafi. When people are looking for a Christmas present for that awkward uncle or aunt, uh, he has a book, Don't Forget Us Here. So Guantanamo was obviously the US's response to 9-11. They decided to it, totally illegally pick up about 800 Muslim men in various parts allegedly responsible for 9-11, which none of them were, and hundreds of them were deemed to be, well, they were all tortured for years anyway, um, but none of them really, maybe a handful were convicted. So we had a huge event in the European Parliament, amazing. And it's actually, the pl- footage from it is on our podcast, I Foresee Trouble. It's, you'd be bawling your eyes out. We were sobbing during the meeting. There wasn't a dry eye in the house in it because we had American lawyers, brilliant, both military and civilian American lawyers, brilliant people, three Guantanamo detainees. We had an aunt of of somebody who lost their life in 9-11 saying, I don't want these men treated like this for us. We had the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, uh, who was an Irish woman, amazing. But Mansoor is over um, as part of his book signing. So he, he's coming into Dublin airport. So we're going to have him for a couple of months. He'll be around doing basic schools and talks about what happened in Guantanamo. He was picked up as a young man in Afghanistan. He's from Yemen. He was 19. He was sold to the Americans. They warlord sort of said, and this was happening, that he was somebody else, which he wasn't some ISIS terrorist or some yoke, sent off to Guantanamo and... Uh, Spent 14 years there being tortured daily and he was eventually, because the American law, he can't be resettled back to Yemen. Uh, so he is living in Serbia now, which is not ideal, to be honest. <laughs> and, and why is that? Well, I suppose Serbia is probably like Ireland was 30 years ago, you know. It would be very white. Uh, would, there wouldn't be too many Muslims. Um, the standard of living, it would be, you know, wouldn't be very cosmopolitan. And then they speak a different language, which he has learned a bit, like, you know, but uh, Europe would be, you know, EU countries, Western Europe would be more suitable for someone like him, I suppose, you know. So it's hard. Nobody speaks the language. It's been hard to make friends and yeah. move on for him. But no, he's an amazing guy. Amazing. So I have to pick him up in case the, the customs hold him or make it difficult for him. But no, we're looking forward to a great guy. And he is just, and all of them, as we said at the event, they're a symbol of the best that humanity has to offer. Here you have some guy, he's 40 now, basically 20 years of his life he's been incarcerated for nothing. He has never done any crime. He just happened to be a young man walking down a road in Afghanistan at the wrong time in the wrong place uh, and ends up, his whole course of his life has gone. He and he's no seen. family over there? He has or? family in Yemen, but uh, some of them have died since he's been in. Some of them have been born. Uh, he can't really go back. It's probably too difficult now. It's just too long. But uh, he does talk to them. I think um, on, you know, the internet and all of that, he, he does. Um, so, yeah. God, it's, it's, crazy, it's horrific. But, it's horrific. But he's still full of the joys of life, still fighting for the brothers, as he calls them, to get the others out because they said, don't forget us here, you know. So we need to buy his book. He's amazing. But when he's, oh. you know, he's such a lovely guy. Um, but you think that somebody who has been brutalised like that for such a long time and they give all their time to fight for the others left behind. But isn't it, it's like, isn't that the best of humanity as well? It's it's just amazing that people can survive such brutality. And that has to give us hope because we have to, I'm a very optimistic person. Here I am sobbing again. <laughs> Myself and me, all these meetings we You're have. You're making me sob too. We do <clears> this. In the doll, we were always crying. Do you? Over, oh God, all the time. I said, Jesus, our, our meetings are all full of emotion. But I mean, why wouldn't they be? It's yeah, life, isn't it? It is. As we said at the Guantanamo meeting, and we were literally bawling during it because you couldn't but. It's horrific what happened to those men. Absolutely horrific. And, uh, you know, I said, well, yeah, there's worse things you can do than cry, isn't there? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, look, I'm really aware that you, you, you're under time pressure and I wanted to talk to you about the climate change and I want to talk to you about what you do for the Global South as well back. and all that. Will you just come back? <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> it has to maybe another time, but... Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. No, another, another time. Can we just talk briefly about climate change because I know you're really yeah. passionate about that. Just a little overview and then, and then we'll wrap it up. This is the biggest challenge facing humanity and we have not got our act together at all. And that's terrifying from the point of view of our kids and our grandkids. There will be nothing unless we get our act together. And now there's a narrative out there that the EU is the most progressive. We're leading the world. We're great and everyone else is terrible. We're, it's not even actually true. Being better than the next worst isn't good enough. Nobody is doing enough. And what we see now 
and it's getting scary as we reach European elections is a lot of the policies are being stripped back. So we've had some really bad votes in recent weeks in the parliament in, in pushback on issues like nature restoration in terms of use of pesticides and these things. They've been watered down because of this, I suppose, idea that you need to sort of appeal to the electorate and sort of go with the climate deniers or whatever. So we need to be doing a lot more, a lot more. Uh, in terms of climate and you know part of the battle in being anti-war is to defend the climate because in our sanctioning and all of that we've turned to opening up coal production again in Europe it's utter lunacy and this doesn't get discussed anywhere Nord Stream 2 is blown up uh, the environmental damage done from that it was absolutely astronomical nobody talks about that it's but sure, even the environmental damage from war yeah, yeah. and the raising of of, of grounds yeah. and then the building of more cement buildings and yeah. all that it's just it's perpetuating itself isn't totally, it totally totally and um, you know there's a lot of speculation that's going on in Gaza there's oil and gas in Gaza and that's kind of behind that as well but um, you know it's utterly devastating and I mean you know people are much more conscious and a lot of people try their very best in their individual actions to do initiatives but the truth is and I think the Guardian have an article the other day about it that 1% of the population are responsible for 66% of the emissions of the world so 1% are res- so we could get that 1% to behave itself and change its ways well then you'll have put a massive dent in it that's what we need that's and the is that problem what, are really. we the 1%? we wouldn't be in that no okay. not as individuals no okay. absolutely not I mean it, the 1% wealthiest individuals really okay. rather than countries okay. and their behaviour you know okay. but uh, yeah it's frightening frightening Claire what advice would you give young people today? I think Try to look at things from the perspective of somebody else. That's, I mean, that might seem stupid, like, you know, but uh, just there's too much focus on the individual, I think. Young people, it's very difficult being a young person now. I don't envy them. The pressure's on them to conform, to look a certain way, to behave a certain way, to be constantly that pressure from social media. My best advice would be to ditch social media and your phone, but that's completely impractical. So that would be utterly ludicrous for me to suggest that, even though people would be much healthier if they did. But if I can't do it, young people can't. So given that you're operating in that environment and it's particularly toxic and hectic, just try and always think about something from the point of view of someone else. Look at something from another person's perspective. You'll be much happier if you do. Don't concentrate on yourself all the time. Do something nice for someone else. You'll be much happier if you do that yourself. Like people too much focus on themselves. I mean, life is what happens when you're making other plans. So just be nice to the person who walks by. Say hello, smile at them. These things actually make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's not great advice to them. No, no, it's not great career advice or anything, but you will be happier. Yeah. You know, Eastern cultures are completely different. In Western culture, we place huge emphasis on people, on commercialism, on the individual. It's all you, 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 and you need to do that. And it's all about you. Actually, human beings only operate in terms of our association with other people and that collective. I mean, what's the point in having all the money in the world if you have no one to share it with or anything? So that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, we... we we have a responsibility to others around us and just be, see yourself as part of a community rather than an individual and you'll be much, much happier. You totally will. I think so. And what's the meaning of life? For me, it's good food, good wine, good books and good company. And they, <laughs> they don't, none of them need to be expensive or anything, but they're all very important because, you know, what's it all about? Sure, I don't know what it's all. Philosophers have spent generations thinking that little me doesn't know the answer to that. But what is life for me? And I do think it is the point that a lot of people say, well, I will do this when I've done that. I will relax when I get this done or I will go on a... Try and make the most of the day because this is life. This is life. When you wake up today and tomorrow, that's life. It's the experiences that you have with other people. And if you say, well, OK, I'm in college now, but I, when I get a good job, I'll do something. I know you have to plan. People can't, but, but try and make the most of the day that's in it. And for me, nice food and it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, nice wine. Um, definitely good books and totally good company it's the same point really isn't it it's you only really enjoy life if you're doing it with others 
Claire, you are a lady. And you are also... <laughs> Tell all those people who said yeah. I was a weirdo. Listen, I know it's terrible. Un- I know I am. I know you're it's You're unbelievable. <laughs> you are just fantastic. And I'm definitely going to be hanging you to come back in a video. Okay, well, we okay? might. Let's see if we'll see if we can do that, right? Okay. <laughs> Seeing as we ran out of time. But okay. thanks so much. And Thank thanks you so your much. mother for the cakes. No Absolutely problem. legend. It was... I'm just... I, I just want to get this out like, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Laura. Thanks a million.